Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Canadian football was born in the mid-1800s, a child of rugby reshaped by robust young men off on a new world adventure. The version they devised, rougher, tougher, bloodier, found a home on university athletic fields where the student body became the game's first fans. But this wonderful new game was strictly a Canadian phenomenon until a fateful weekend in 1874 when the men of McGill University accepted an invitation to play two matches at Harvard and found the Americans playing a different game entirely, an offshoot of soccer containing little of the rough and tumble chaos now so dear to the Canadians' hearts. They played one game under the Canadian rules, under McGill's rules, one game under the uh, Harvard rules, in the end, Harvard enjoyed the type of football that McGill brought so much that they rode away to rugby school in England and they got the official rugby rules. The game of the North was now a cross-border phenomenon. Soon, it spilled over the campuses and into the cities, then west with the settlers. No longer merely the sport of the educated elite, it became the game of the working masses. Teams sprang out of meetings held in rooms over grocery stores, in mechanics halls and rowing clubs. Bankers bashed iron workers. Lawyers took their lumps from lumberjacks. Leagues were born, collapsed, and rose again. A new country had a new game and new heroes. By the turn of the century, football had been embraced by athletes of all ages and from all walks of life, competing for trophies of every shape and size. In 1909, word of this new game caught the attention of Albert Henry George Gray, the fourth Earl Gray and the Governor General of Canada. Well-known patrons of Canadian arts, the Earl and his wife decided that the new game should have a true national championship. At a cost of $48, Lord Grey provided a simple silver trophy that would one day be the stuff of dreams, the Grey Cup. The cup was donated by uh, the Governor General, uh, Lord Earl Grey, who probably never saw a game played. Uh, he put up the trophy for the Amateur Football Championship of Canada, and people who were playing football in all parts of Canada saw it as emblematic of the national championship. The first Grey Cup game was held on a chilly December Saturday in 1909. 3,800 fans made the trek to Rosedale Field to watch the University of Toronto defeat the Parkdale Canoe Club in what was rather grandly called the Canadian Championship. But Lord Grey's trophy wasn't there. Someone had forgotten to have it engraved. The games then were simple gatherings young and not-so-young athletes out for a rough-and-tumble afternoon. 
But soon, Earl Grey's Cup was more than just another trophy. As the decades passed and the number of challengers grew, it would become the new game's Holy Grail. In the 1940s, not even a world in conflict could halt the yearly quest. When Canada went to war, enlisted men formed teams and battled for the cup under military banners. Through rain, fog, mud, or the chill of Canadian winter, the cup chase never faltered. Now, the pursuers wanted more than the championship. They wanted that magical, matchless moment when they could grasp Earl Grey's cup and triumphantly hold it high. When you win the Grey Cup, you know, you're, you're on such a high because you've accomplished what nine teams start out to do and only one does. What it meant to the city of Winnipeg and the fans, uh, that's when it starts sinking in uh, of just how important the Grey Cup is and what it means to the people of Canada. It really didn't hit you till a few days later and you, you know, when you get back in Edmonton and you're going to the parade and say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. The city of Vancouver, on our uh, return, just opened their arms to us. A marvelous thing and very special. There was love here for the BC Lions. 20 below weather, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall, where they took us back to on buses, and the town just went nuts. Every team sets out, and you want to win the championship. Win the championship. That is a successful season. Anything else isn't successful. It didn't really hit me at the, after the game. It hit me the next year, seeing that this trophy is going to be forever. Your name's going to be a part of it, and you're going to be associated with the Great Cup winning team. Canadian football's eastern roots gave this rugged game at least a touch of refinement. Out west, settlers toughened by hardship and prairie winters reveled in their own bone-crushing version, fought with a ferocity and abandon that turned a simple game into a no-quarter battle. They just threw money into the pot, and the first one that drew blood uh, got the money. Uh, there were a lot of broken bones and uh, broken noses and front teeth missing and that kind of thing. In the uh, first game, Regina played against Saskatoon. Up in Saskatoon, the uh, police chief was so upset with the fact that the uh, Regina team was winning and he thought they were playing too rough against the Saskatoon boys that he came on the field and had the Regina team arrested. In spite of the potential for injury or arrest, football thrived on the Canadian prairie. The Hamilton Tigers became the first team to journey west, playing exhibition games in Winnipeg, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Calgary. While Eastern teams were happy to share the game with the West, sharing their championship trophy was another matter. Only Eastern teams were, would play for the Grey Cup. And in 1911, the Calgary Tigers won the, the championship of the West, and they challenged. They wanted to play in the Grey Cup. And the CRU wouldn't let them. They, they would first turn them down. They said, you didn't play in the East, you, you can't play challenge for the Grey Cup. Finally, with great reluctance, the Edmonton Eskimos were allowed to come east in 1921 to challenge Toronto for the right to sip from the Earl's silvered mug. Their timing couldn't have been worse. They ran head on to the man known as the big train, Lionel Conacher. They ended up losing 23 to nothing in that game. Conacher, as a matter of fact, uh, scored 15 points and uh, halfway through the third quarter had to leave because he had a hockey game that night. Hockey and football were just two of the many sports on the Conica resume. All played so brilliantly that he was named Canada's athlete of the half century. Since 1921, Western teams had marched east for the Grey Cup game, only to fall to the Eastern football powerhouses. In desperation, they cast their eyes not to the heavens, but to the south. 
We didn't have the population in the West that uh, they had in the East, so in order to get enough guys, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had to supplement them with uh, good, uh, experienced American players from American colleges. And, uh, of course, the first su most successful of those teams was the Winnipeg team in 1935. Winnipeg coach Joe Ryan took a fishing trip to Minnesota and North Dakota that fateful summer of 1935. His bait, money, and he landed his limit. For $7,400, he came home with nine imports, including the West's first superstar, the incomparable Fritzy Hansen. With Fritzy carrying the mail, the Bombers romped through the West and into the Grey Cup game, where, on a muddy field in Hamilton, stunned Easterners got their first look at the little big man from Minnesota. Fritzy Hansen was an import that, for Winnipeg, and he was one of these scatbacks that could dangle. And he caught a couple of kicks and ran right through the whole team because nobody had any traction. He had the whole field to himself, and he made the game look easy for Winnipeg, and he made a great name for himself. In Fritzy and Friends, the Canadian Rugby Union did not see players of great skill. They saw a threat to the very game itself, with teams buying championships and Americans shoving local boys off the roster. Their solution changed the rules. The CRU decided that uh, they didn't want these American imports coming in uh, specifically to win a competition. So they passed what was called a, a one-year residency rule. And they said that any American playing in the Grey Cup game had to be in the country for at least one year prior to the game. American imports were now a fact of Canadian football life. Although their numbers increased with the years, they did not destroy the game as the CRU had so darkly predicted. They enhanced it. The Northern League thrived, an alliance that continues to bring great American players to a game that remains distinctly Canadian. There's something about the Canadian Football League in Canada. It's got a tremendous uh, history about it when you go back and look at some of the great people that have come up here and lived in this country and they got the opportunity to play. I mean, this is what the game's all about. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. During the depression, there was seldom a penny to spare for children's games. But kids who longed to play football could always find a way. Nobody had a football, so we'd take somebody's cap, you know the old caps that the kids used to wear, you'll see them in pictures, and stuff it with uh, padding, and we, so we have no kicking game, so it's a running game only. And uh, that's how we got started. All our footballs were homemade. We couldn't afford a football. Well, I had some made like a football, made out of a sack or some stuff, sack or a pig's bladder or something like that. But the only time that I ever touched a real football is when I went to uh, high school. But young boys become young men, and there are real footballs to be thrown and real games to be played. As a pastime becomes a passion, a game becomes a way of life. Though the stakes grow higher and the wins more important, it all comes down to a simple love of the game. Canadian football was plain, old-fashioned mayhem. You played it, in my day, you played it because you loved the game. The players didn't make any money, they, uh, and so they all held jobs. Stukas worked for the star. And uh, as a football writer, while well, at the time he was playing, which he certainly gave himself the benefit of the doubt in his stories, 
Stukas tells the story of playing for the Argonauts when they won the Grey Cup, I think it was 1938, and uh, all he got for it was a windbreaker. Uh, he says a really nice windbreaker. Though the players weren't making any money, they could see by the crowds paying their way into the parks that someone was. They decided it was time they got a piece of the pie. The man the Toronto Argonauts picked to plead their case, Annis Stukas. Management was quick to respond. How dare this goddamn football player ask for money? We let them play, we give them great uniforms, we go to the best hotels when we go out of towns. Holy mackerel, and now the guy wants money? Playing football in Canada was an uncertain profession at best, but the harsh Canadian winter was a virtual guarantee. Uh, I used to die in the cold. Uh, because you have the lighter uniforms on, so every time you hit the ground, you took a chunk out of your hide. It, you literally did take a chunk out of your body. And the, the, the most painful thing I had to do that day was take a shower. It was so painful to, to get in that water. In our first game, the referee had to stand under the goalpost. It was snowing so hard to see if the ball was going through on field goals and extra points. And I said, what did I get myself into here? I'm cold. Football was a daylight game. If dusk fell before the final gun, finishing the contest required a little help from the crowd. Fans were urged to park their cars along the sidelines because if the game got going too long, then uh, what would happen was that they'd turn the lights on and on their cars and, uh, and, and play it out that particular way. We were playing a game in Ottawa, and we played the last 10 minutes of that game, or five minutes of that game, uh, under headlights. They, they got the people to turn their headlights on in the cars, and that's how we finished the game. By the 1930s, football had been in Canada for better than a half century, and still the game looked a lot like rugby. The forward pass had found its way into the rule book, but not everyone cared, or dared, to use it. The kicking was the essence of the game. What the guys did is that they punted the ball and then ran down underneath it. As the forward pass came in, in 19 around 1930, there were different rules. For example, if a pass was incomplete, it was a fumble. And so uh, it was used very judiciously. The man who changed all that was Warren Stevens. In 1931, he threw the Grey Cup's first touchdown pass in Montreal's 22-0 win over Regina. But change requires time. While the forward pass could be a quick and devastating weapon when successful, throwing the ball was still no simple matter. To be honest with you, we, we didn't throw that many passes as, as they do today. The, the darn balls, they were almost like, almost like a soccer ball. It was very difficult to, to grab a hold of the darn thing, so you just you laid it on the palm of your hand and threw it. In other words, you didn't grip it. Well, the ball we used was relatively primitive because it wasn't dimpled to enable the quarterback to grasp it easier. And when I look at it, I, you know, I can't believe the, the size and the shape compared to how it is today. Pass, run, or kick, the name of the game was hitting, and the padding offered little protection. The equipment I used, uh, people would laugh at. What you got when you went up with the big team was secondhand furniture. The training camp, the, the new guys coming in took old-timers equipment from a year or two years past. And if the shoes were a size too big, tough luck, wear them. The post-war years were a boom time for Canadian football. In 1948, 
the Calgary Stampeders galloped through the three-team West as they recorded the only undefeated season in league history. Heading east, the four-day train trip became a traveling party as the Stampeders made the cross-country trek to the Grey Cup game. Arriving with Stetson-topped fans, Indian Chiefs, chuck wagons, and horses, the Stampeders didn't just come from the West, they brought the West with them. The 1948 Great Cup game was pivotal in uh, turning a celebration into a national festival. The Calgary Stampeders brought their chuck wagons, loaded them on the train, uh, they had flapjack breakfast, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension and uh, from that time on I think almost every Great Cup game has been measured by what happened in 1948. The Stampeders did more than defeat the Ottawa Rough Riders 12-7. Their victory and their fans' western exuberance turned a three-hour showdown into a week-long hoedown, and the party has never stopped. Grey Cup Day has become Grey Cup Week, a game once of regional interest is now a national obsession. And so, the story of the modern-day CFL begins. It is the story of a league often battered but never down of a game that is an important thread in the Canadian cultural fabric, a game that is ours and ours alone. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball. And I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. The excitement in the game, in a Canadian football game, with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart, an annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion.
At the dawn of the 20th century, Edmonton had little in the way of big city life, but it did have Canadian football. The Edmonton Eskimos were born in 1910, but through the decades, the team lived an uncertain existence as leagues came and went. Spurred by the excitement of the Calgary Stampeders' victory in the 1948 Grey Cup, 20,000 Edmonton fans bought $1 shares, revived the team, and brought in a man who could kick field goals and coach, Annis Stukas. Stuke came in here, and boy, he talked up a storm. He was wonderful because he spoke everywhere. He was around the city, and he did more off the field maybe than what he did on the field and in coaching the club. I'm not saying the club was bad, but I mean, you know, they were starting in 49, but if you wanted to make an impact, Anna Stuke has made an impact. Stuke spent three seasons in Edmonton as the Eskimos assembled a powerful roster, including Billy Vessels, outstanding receiver Roly Miles, the China Clipper Normie Kwong, and perhaps the greatest of them all, an all-round athlete from Mississippi State, Jackie Parker. I really wasn't expecting to ever make a living playing football. I thought I might be able to be good enough to, to make a living playing baseball. And Darrell Royal, who was my backfield coach in, in Mississippi State, went to Edmonton as head coach so he came back and he said, you know, he says, you could, uh, you'd really like Edmonton, you'd really like the way they play football. He says, uh, I think you got a good, really good chance up there. In 1954, with Bernie Filoni at quarterback and outstanding rookie Parker at halfback, the Eskimos captured the West, earning a trip to the Grey Cup. Facing the Eastern powerhouse Montreal Alouettes, few gave the Eskimos a chance. They were huge underdogs. They were going up against the mighty Montreal Alouettes. There was no interlocking play in those days. And so they'd never seen one another. And no one, no one gave the Eskimos a chance. It, it was really strange to me because uh, we went into that 1954 game, read all the press clippings about the Montreal Alouette team, and saw um, Red O'Quinn, saw um, Echeverry, saw Hal Patterson. They were just a massively talented team and we wondered I, I wondered, anyway, how we'd ever beat them. The Montreal offense lived up to its reputation, but the Eskimos battled back. With less than three minutes remaining and the Elves threatening to put the game away, Montreal halfback Chuck Hunsinger fumbled, and Jackie Parker raced 90 yards into history. When I picked the ball up, it really was just a matter of running, and Sam Echeverry, the Montreal quarterback, was about 10 yards away, but uh, I, I, I had a little more speed than Sam, and I had an edge on him anyway, so it was just a matter of running it down the field, and it turned into being quite a play. Parker's touchdown and Bob Dean's point after gave the Eskimos the win in their first Grey Cup championship. For Parker, the victory brought both elation and relief. When we finished the Grey Cup that day, I was tired, and I was pretty beat up. So it was just a matter of, you know, it was jubilation, it was joy, it was happiness to win. But you know, it really didn't hit you till a few days later. Then you really, you know, it really kind of hit you then. And say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. Edmonton's surprising victory marked the beginning of a dynasty. For three consecutive seasons, Eskimo fans would celebrate as their heroes defeated the Eastern champion Alouettes in the Grey Cup final. While the Eskimos boasted a star-filled roster, it was Jackie Parker who shone brighter than all. Jackie Parker is the best ever did it. The guy played halfback, defense and offense halfback. The guy played quarterback. He punted the ball. He kicked off. He kicked field goals. He did everything but sell tickets. He could do anything you asked him on the field. He, he could run back kickoffs if you wanted him to. He could uh, play defense, and all this on a pair of legs that you wouldn't believe could carry him across the street. But he um, was really an amazing athlete. I had nightmares about that guy because, uh, you know, there's some people that you can, that have the, the will, you know, the will to win, the will to do things. And he willed himself to do a lot of things because you look at him, he's not a, you know, he's a spindly-legged, you know, kind of a guy, but a great competitor. When you put Parker, Jackie Parker, Johnny Bright, Normie Kwong, I mean, that was a tough act to beat. In 
1959, Tommy Joe Coffey made the long trip from West Texas State University to Edmonton's Clark Stadium, where his real football education began. All of a sudden, you're playing and practicing against guys that uh, are playing for money. They're paying to feed their families. They're playing to pay the rent. They're paying to pay the mortgage on the house or the car or whatever the case may be. And it's dead serious. We had seven people competing for the position I was playing. So Jackie threw me a ball and I dropped it. Come back to the huddle and I said, uh, sorry. And he looked at me and he said, no. He said, don't be sorry. We're going to run the same play. I'm going to throw the ball in the same spot. And if you drop it, just keep right on going, get in your car and leave because you won't make this football team. I don't think I ever dropped another ball to Jack Thuton. Through much of the 60s, the Eskimos struggled. When rookie kicker Dave Cutler joined the team in 1969, Edmonton fans saw little to jeer about. My rookie season was brutal. Um, I'd like to say I was bad, but um, I was worse than that. I mean, it's not many guys can say single-handedly they can get a coach fired. And I, I think the numbers were that uh, we lost five games by a total of nine points. And that year, I believe I missed seven converts. So my second year, I decided that I was either going to do it right or not do it at all. Dave Cutler did more than get it right, as he went on to dominate the CFL kicking game for the next 15 seasons. In the 70s, the Eskimos began to rise again, led by quarterback Bruce Lemmerman, receiver George McGowan, and a late cut from the BC Lions, quarterback Tom Wilkinson. I came over with the thought, if I don't make the team, because there's no guarantees, then I'll stop by Calgary uh, after I get released. And then if I don't make it there, that's on my way down to Wyoming to go back and get a, a job. Tom Wilkinson's stop in Edmonton would last through 10 highlight-filled seasons. Although many had questioned Wilkinson's athletic abilities, in Edmonton, he quickly proved that he knew how to win. My biggest asset was I was a very good student of the game. And I knew what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were. And that's why you never saw me try to throw many 60-yard passes, because it would have taken me three to get at 60 yards. When he came to Edmonton, he just absolutely turned around a team that was going in 35 different directions and absolutely taught people how to win in just a very self-effacing and humble way. He was just an absolutely amazing man. Ray Yock was the coach one year, and uh, Wilkie uh, went down in the game and uh, had to be replaced for the last few minutes, and we asked him, uh, what's wrong with Wilkie? He said, he sprained his fat. <laughs> to me, that just sort of defined Wilkie, but he just somehow got it done. When they didn't have the ball, the Eskimos turned loose the Wolves, a defense led by Dr. Death, Dave Fennell, and 1975 arrival, linebacker Dan Kepley. Danny Ray, when he came in, you just knew that this guy was somebody different. I mean, he sat right across from me. And I mean, I just watched this guy look around the dressing room, and I mean, he was just like a caged dog. I mean, you know that this dog could get out and get after it. When you're six foot, maybe 205, maybe 210 pounds on your best day. Uh, I had to try to be crazy and do crazy things to make people either afraid of me uh, or think I was 6'4", 245. There is to no extremes what I would go to to make sure that I created the perception that I needed for me to get the job done. He was one of the few players I ever coached that actually speeded up as he made his tackles. His deal was to get you in the radar screen and then he just accelerated right through and ran through you. He didn't tackle people in a beautiful way. It wasn't form tackling, it was a collision. The 1975 Grey Cup featured the Eskimos and the Montreal Alouettes. 
When Montreal's Don Sweet missed a last-minute field goal, Edmonton celebrated a one-point victory. It was the third year in a row we had gone to a Grey Cup, and we had lost the first two. And, and I never doubted our, our ability to win or desire to win. What it did more than anything else was prove that you could do it. That 75 Grey Cup was probably the start of what the Eskimos started to become. Because that particular year, we had won uh, five or six games in the last two minutes. And all of a sudden, people started to fear what we as a team could do, and probably more importantly, what Wilkie and Bruce could do. In 1977, the Eskimos signed a coaching unknown, a 36-year-old with no professional experience, Hugh Campbell. When I was offered the job in Edmonton, I wasn't uh, confident that I was qualified to, to take the job. Matter of fact, I was quite young, and uh, so I, I had some doubts. I, I felt confident that I could do it if, if I could just get started, if people could believe in me. Despite his youth and lack of experience, Campbell quickly earned the respect of his players with his unique approach to the game. I knew that players were used to a long list of rules. Don't do this, don't do this, be on time for this. I only had one rule, it was don't do anything that in the head coach's opinion is detrimental to the team performance. That was my rule. The 1977 Edmonton Montreal Grey Cup became famous for the construction staples the Alouettes used for traction. On a frozen field in Olympic Stadium, Edmonton would never find their footing as they lost the game 41 to 6. To me, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to the Edmonton Eskimos because as the, as the local media didn't believe us, they thought we were making excuses, that made us work that much harder in the off season that we wanted to go back to prove that we were a better team in that, that those staples did make a difference. It just became sort of a rallying point for us that regardless of what circumstances, what hand you were dealt, um, we would shut up and play football. We could not wait until the 1978 season to play Montreal. We didn't care where it was. We'd have played them in a parking lot. We played flag football, but we were not going to lose to the Montreal Alouettes again. The 1978 Grey Cup would give the Eskimos their chance for revenge. But this time, there would be a new quarterback in the green and gold, a US college star who was ready for the NFL long before the NFL was ready for him. That discrimination and stereotype made me both sad and angry because uh, you know, I felt like it just wasn't fair that I should get the same opportunity anybody else should. I should be judged on my abilities and not on my skin color or some stereotyping. Hugh Campbell came down and made known his interest in me as a quarterback. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I, I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. When Warren Moon got here, he was absolutely everything I thought he was. And everybody said, boy, you really taught him. I said, yeah, what did I teach him? How to run real fast or to throw the ball 80 yards? I always thought it was a break for me that I was getting to play half the game. Everybody else said, well, that was really a break for him because he got to play right away. Well, he was good enough to play right away. Edmonton's triumph in the 1978 Grey Cup marked the beginning of the greatest dynasty in CFL history. Back-to-back -back victories over the Alouettes, followed by a decisive 48-10 win over the Hamilton Tiger Cats, made the Eskimos seem practically unbeatable. But in the 81 final against Ottawa, Rough Riders quarterback J.C. Watts took charge. As Warren Moon and the Eskimos struggled, it looked like Edmonton's championship reign was about to end. We were down 20 to 1 at halftime, and we're not getting anything going. And Warren is the starter, and Wilkie comes in uh, late in the second quarter and puts on a show. Puts on a show. You know, I played a disastrous first half. You know, Wilkie came in and kind of got us settled down right before the half. 
And in the second half, we were able to make some plays offensively. Our defense stepped up and really got us the football, shut them down. I think we had total focus that at some point we were going to find a way to win this football game. With an amazing 26-23 victory, the Eskimo streak continued. Following the retirement of Tom Wilkinson, Warren Moon took over. In the 1982 Grey Cup against Toronto, he connected with his favorite target, receiver Brian Kelly, to bring a fifth consecutive championship to Hugh Campbell's Eskimos. We ended up winning five Grey Cups in a row. So I got five rings out of the six years that I was there. It was a great run, probably one of the greatest runs you'll ever see in sports. Again, I don't think you'll ever see a team win five straight championships in any sport, but we had a great, great run. In 1983, the Edmonton Eskimos found the perfect replacement for Warren Moon, a quarterback who played like a linebacker, Louisiana Tech grad Matt Dunnigan. Matt Dunnigan was the first quarterback after Warren Moon, which is not a, a, you wouldn't think that would be a good time, but Matt was one of those feisty, smart, uh, competitive quarterbacks, and he was cocky enough to replace Warren Moon and uh, skilled enough. I didn't know who Warren Moon was. Um, I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know where Edmonton, Alberta was. Uh, I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL, put my best foot forward, which I was taught to do, and give it my best shot and see what happens. While Dunnigan replaced Moon, the Eskimos were about to discover a player like none other, a kick return specialist who brought the fans to their feet, Henry Gizmo Williams. Well, when I first came up and I saw this big old wide field, like, I'm like, holy shazam. Like, I said to myself, thank God I didn't run track up here. <laughs> this field was huge. Gizmo kept the Eskimos the Eskimos. Uh, he, uh, he had the sizzle. They, they didn't have a lot of stakes some, through some of those years, but he just came in here and he just stole the hearts of the town from the oldest little old lady in town to the youngest kid. They just loved the guy and what he did. The Giz had two speeds. Faster and faster. I mean, he could turn it on. One time we were in Edmonton, and Giz took off, and I'm like, I got the angle on this puppy. He's about 30 yards away from me, still upfield, and I got the angle. I'm going to the sideline. By the time I got to the sideline, I turned, all I saw were cleats. He was gone. Although Edmonton is a long way from Tennessee, not even the chill of a Canadian winter could slow down the Giz. Mountains 25 was the best I liked, because I loved that. I used to spray my jersey down with water when I get outside, because it turned the ice and slip and the guys couldn't grab me. <laughs> Dunnigan's hard charging style made injuries a constant threat. In 1986, the Eskimos got an insurance plan, Damon Allen. I remember sitting down with Damon and telling him, look, I said, this is, I, uh, I'm the starter, you know, you're trying to take my job. I understand that. It's good, healthy competition. But don't lose sight of the fact that we're in this together. And so Damon and I are always able to have a great working relationship and support one another. In the 87 Grey Cup, Dunnigan went down to injury. Damon Allen responded with an MVP performance, and Gizmo Williams electrified the crowd with a 115-yard touchdown run and a 38-36 win over the Argos. When I won my first Grey Cup, it was almost like me being in a plane crash or something. I lived through it. That's what it felt like to me. Because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know should I drink. I didn't know should I run outside naked. I didn't know what the hell to do. But it was something inside of me like, man, do you realize you just won the Great Cup, the, the number one game in the CFL? In 1991, Ron Lancaster was named head coach of the Eskimos. Two years later, he had Edmonton in championship form. We felt the team, we had a chance. Now, there were some times during the year when they certainly didn't look like we were going to win. But late in the season, come the 1st of October, we got on a roll. I mean, we started winning. And when you start winning and you start gaining confidence, man, if things start to mushroom, and you, know, you, you all of a sudden start to feel good about yourself. 1993 brought another Grey Cup to Edmonton, a 33-23 victory over Winnipeg. When that game ended, it was fun just kind of stand over here on the side with you and just kind of watch what's going on. Because it, you know, you, you know 
it's done, man. It, it's accomplished. You have won the Grey Cup. But the best thing about that is, in, is to watch the players. Everybody was up on the stage, and I was standing about 30 yards away, just in the middle of the field, looking at the stage as they received the Grey Cup. And then I looked over beside me, and there was Ronnie Lancaster. And uh, the two of us were just watching everybody else uh, get the award, and it was just where we wanted to be at that moment. The names may change and the stars may come and go, but in Edmonton football, there is one constant. Rain or shine, the fans are there. I ran more touchdowns on that grass field because of the fans in Edmonton. I just always felt like when I line up on that football field, I always had that extra. It was 13 guys on the football field. I had that one extra with the fans. The fans love the Eskimos because, I mean, listen, what is it now, 32 consecutive years they've made the playoffs. Uh, they've won all of those great cup championships, but they played very, very entertaining ball. And so the fans respond in a like way. They say, we're with you, we love you. Well now, a funny story that, that some people can relate to. I'm cleaning out a chicken house for cage layers. And it was hot, it was only about 105 degrees and there's some kid drives up in a car and he said, Tommy Joe, he said, there's some guy from the Edmonton Eskimos in the coach's office that wants to talk about your playing football in Canada. Well, I said, man, I can't, I'm making 75 cents an hour I can't leave here because I, I'll, I'll be there in a couple hours when I get through. And two hours later, I go into the coach's room and a, a man by the name of Sam Lyle was sitting there. And he at that time was coach of the Edmonton Eskimos. And he was talking to me about coming to play for the Eskimos and he was up at the board. He was drawing all the X's and O's and all of this and explaining uh, the Edmonton Eskimos and this guy's name's Jackie Parker and this one's Johnny Bright and this one's Roly Miles and he was impressing me with people. Well, I didn't know who they were. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll sign with the Edmonton Eskimo. Well, you know, they sent me a check for $1,000. Well, I, I was cleaning out a chicken house for six bits an hour and a thousand dollar check was, was that's more money than I've seen in two years. And I tell people, well, look what I got. Well, where's Edmonton? I didn't even know the Eskimos played football. Well, yeah, they do in Edmonton. When I get to Edmonton, Sam Lyle is gone. I didn't know that. And at the time, uh, the Edmonton Eskimo football offices was on 109th Street in Edmonton. And I go walking in there and say, I want to see Sam Lyle. Well, Sam, not here, not with us any longer. The man's name is Eagle Keys. He looked at me and he said, uh, coffee, and he always does this kind of thing when he's got something to say and he wants to clear his throat and get it out. He said, uh, you've lost about 20 pounds and shrunk four inches from what all of the, the, the clippings on you said. And I said, no, coach, I said, I'm the same size now I was, have been for the last four or five years. Uh, and here I am. He said, well, you're not very big. And I said, I may not be very big, but I said, Eagle, I'll put you in the Hall of Fame one of these days because I'll be the best football player you've ever seen. And he said, well, we'll look at you. Well, long story short, Eagle made the best decision that he's ever made. He kept me and, and the rest is history. God almighty, David Cutler was the, 
David Cutler was a kicker. David Cutler was a kicker who loved being a kicker. But more than loved being a kicker, Dave Cutler loved being a football player. And what he wished he was a football player because he, he, he was a middle linebacker dressed up in number 26 that had to kick the balls. And so his we, I, if I heard another story, if I heard one more story of David Cutler's uh, times of being a linebacker with Simon Frazier, you know, I had to yawn a few times. Now, Cuddy would go down, and every time on the kickoff, as he was kicking off, and, I, and I'm right behind him, I'm getting ready to move, and he'd look at and he he looks at and move that grit in his face. He just kept, I got you covered. You're free. So all that meant was he would take a position that I normally have so I could just I could run and try to track down the ball. Next thing you know, I'm seeing Cutler. All he wanted to do was throw his body into the middle of the pile somewhere. God hope that he would get bruised up a bit. Then he could go sit in the locker room and, and in the training room and put ice on it like the rest of the athletes. That made him feel at home. I think a kicker sometimes doesn't really feel like he's as involved with the team as most other players on the team anyway. But Cutler was a little bit different that he felt like he was a real football player, that he would go down and he'd make a hit, that he was just as tough as anybody out there. And in a lot of ways, mentally, he was as tough as anybody on our football team. I had no idea what a great cup game was. I had never heard of this thing. We get to Calgary, it is without a doubt the coldest I have ever seen in, in my life coming from North Carolina. Uh, it was uh, probably 15, 20 below at that, that time. And uh, my father wanted to come up for the game. I, I said, Dad, I, ha I have no idea to tell you how to get here. Here's where we are. You get here. Well, my dad showed up with his, with, with his best friend, and they were in their typical 1975 leisure suits that they had, and they were just flat freezing their asses off. And so m my night before the game of the Grey Cup in 75 was spent taking my dad to this place called the Bay that I had and shopping for clothes for him to wear to the game. We go to the game on, on Sunday. I mean, this is a huge thing for me. It's 35 below zero. I have no clue. I've never seen weather like this before. And in the right at the beginning of the game, there's a streaker that goes down the field. <laughs> I thought, man, is this ever a great country. I got to lift the Great Cup. I got to, to drink champagne out of, the, out of the Great Cup, which I had no idea what that was all about. I think one of, one of, my, one of my fondest memories and, uh, was uh, uh, after the game, Everybody's gone, and, and it's probably when I go out partying with the guys, and this is the first time I've ever had a chance to experience a, a championship on a professional level. Uh, and uh, it's probably about 5 o'clock in the morning. And I, and, I, and I take a case of beer, and I'm heading down in the hotel, and I decide I just want to go sweat, just loosen, because I'm still cold <laughs> from, the, from what's going on outside. And I open up the sauna, and there sits George McGowan, one of the greatest receivers and, and finest men I've ever had a chance to meet. He's sitting there with a case of beer, and we're, we sit there together, and he, he starts telling me, you know, some of the history and something about the game and, and telling me some of the, the, the intimacies about the Edmonton Eskimos and, and the tradition and, and things like that. And, um, you know, later on, uh, as it uh, went on, I, I came to find out, you know, what a man and what a legend that George McGowan was. I didn't know that, you know, to begin with. But that was one of the uh, one of the one of the fondest members I had memories I have of the the first Grey Cup. When I kicked, I I had this lace on my on my kicking shoe. Uh, which was my right foot, and what I would do is tie it around the, the post at the front of the shoe, pull it back around my ankle, and then that would curve the toe up. And by curving the toe up, now what it allowed me to do is that when I was approaching the ball, my left foot could actually get closer to the ball, and uh, when I kicked it, now I was still hitting into the meat of the ball. And um, it, was, it, worked, 
it, like it worked very well for me. But there was one other thing that I did that, uh, for kicking. I saw a picture of Bobby Hull slap shooting. And it was a slow motion picture and the stick, how it bent. And then as it was hitting the puck and then bent back the other way, going through it. And I figured that if I could make my leg bend like that, that I could actually probably get more power than most people had at that time. So what I used to do when I, uh, when I was in the gym, I did a lot of squats. And what I would do is that when I had the weights up there, I would actually start bending my legs backwards. And there's actually pictures of, of me kicking where if this, if this is the knee right here and this is my foot, my leg is actually up like that. It was actually, well, the first time I saw it, I couldn't believe that uh, my leg was bending that much. But so between the, the tying the toe up and this way to hyperextend my leg, it gave me a little more power. Jim Germany probably, in my opinion, was one of the greatest backs that has played in the Canadian Football League that didn't get his just dues. I, I mean, he was on a lot of great cup teams. Jim Germany ran the ball as well as anybody I've ever seen. God forbid, he, he almost looked after the tackle like he wasn't going to get up on every play, like he was dead and get up, and the next thing you know, he'd take it and dash 40 yards. He was up over a thousand yards just about every year that I was there and a very, very valuable part of our football team, not only because of his running, but he blocked as well as any back that I've played around. Uh, he, he made our team a physical football team the way he ran the football. And then he could also catch the ball out of the backfield. So he was a very, very versatile part of our football team and kept teams honest. Even though they knew we were going to throw the ball so many times, they had to be aware of Jim Germany. We would not have been as successful as we were without a guy like Jim Germany carrying the mail force. To say that the Eskimos were a little crazy is an understatement. That was a very loose, fun football team that was very close both on and off the field. And um, I, I grew to, to, to really love that football team and, and treat it like a family more so than I ever thought I would with any other team that I've played for. And I had to learn to be a lot looser being around these guys or, or I was going to just be tormented because the more they felt like it bothered you, the more they were going to do things to you. So, uh, you know, one day I, a lot of guys on our team used to hunt in the morning before they came to practice because we didn't practice till later in the afternoon, like 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. Well, Ron Este was a big hunter. Uh, and one day I came into my locker, uh, came into the locker room, went into my locker, opened it up, and a duck, a dead duck falls down <laughs> that he had a, a rope tied around his neck and falls right in front of me, scared the living bejesus out of me. And uh, all the guys had the greatest laugh out of it because they knew how I was. I was more of a serious type guy, but I also knew that uh, this is the type of team that I was playing for, and I had to have a sense of humor in order to uh, to survive on this football team. And it was, it was a, a great atmosphere because it was a loose atmosphere, and, and everybody knew what we had to do on game day. We got our work done when we needed to get it done, but we also had fun because as a football team, you spend a lot of time together, a tremendous amount of time together. So if you don't do different things like this, it, it can become very monotonous and guys can get bored with, with the situation. But this kept it loose and fresh all the time, and I think that was another one of the main reasons we had so much success for such a long period of time. We really enjoyed being around one another. Brian Kelly was, he was a strange duck. Brian, Brian, he walked funny, he looked funny. He was pale skinned and freckled face and little, short. One of the most phenomenal receivers I have ever seen in my life, ever seen. He worked diligently, tire, tirelessly at at being a perfectionist at what he did. He worked his trade. He had some of the smoothest hands that you would ever see. And that old adage that you say that he could run a whole lot faster scared than mad, he probably was. Because every time that he got in the open and had to outrun somebody, it, 
he took it to the house. And he never ran one route the same way every time. It just depended on how he was being played. And we had tremendous communication between he and I, either during the week of practice or on the sideline during the game. This guy's playing me this way, so this is the way I'm going to run this route this time. And that communication that we had really made us kind of unstoppable. There's this route called a six route where the wide receiver will run like he's going to run a post and then break it out to the corner. The first time I got beat on that was by Brian Kelly in Edmonton. He made me look like a fool. I was really fast at that time. Rich Stubler had told me, if you bump and run Brian Kelly, you will not get beat. Three quarters of the game, I bumped and ran him, had no problems with him. Got a little cocky, backed off. He ran a post corner on me, and when I turned around to find out where he was, the referee was standing there with his arms in the air, touchdown. Brian Kelly told me he watched my feet when he was running his routes. I've never heard that from a receiver say, hey, I'm watching your feet while you know, I'm running the route, and that's how I get open. Didn't have great speed, didn't have great size, but there was nobody in the league that could cover him, and we had a great uh, chemistry between the two of us as far as com completing passes and having success. In 1982, during the first part of the season, we uh, lost several of our offensive players. We lost Brian Kelly and Jim Germany. I think there was five starters out, out of the 12 players. And we ended up struggling quite a bit. And when we came to our Labor Day game, it was our eighth, and at that point in history, that was the halfway mark of the season. And we lost in Calgary on Labor Day, which is hard for me even now to say because that's not supposed to happen very often. But after that game in the locker room, it was a bit like the Alamo and Davy Crockett. I actually drew a line with an imaginary line with my foot in the locker room. And I said, anybody who doesn't think that we can go to the Grey Cup, come over across this line and I will personally guarantee that you get paid the rest of you this season but we don't want you in our way because we're going and uh, the players were either didn't hear me but for some reason no one came across that line and uh, we all uh, left the locker room more on an upbeat than you would normally have after losing a game and uh, as fate would have it, we never did lose again. I never, after, that was the last game I ever lost as a coach in Canada. When I first came up to visit uh, the city of Edmonton, uh, they brought me in to show me uh, the city and, and the place where they played their football at Clark Stadium. and. Uh, they also showed me Commonwealth Stadium, which was under uh, construction and almost completed. So uh, to watch Clark Stadium and say, well, this was where I was going to play the rest of my career, I don't know if that might have happened. It would have been a tough pill to swallow. But to see Commonwealth Stadium over there, you know, a couple of hundred feet away, a, a beautiful 60-plus thousand seat stadium, uh, that was a big selling point for me uh, because I was used to playing in front of big crowds. In college, you know, 70,000 fans every weekend. Uh, in the Rose Bowl, over 100,000 fans. So to have a nice new stadium to play in was a big selling point to me. Uh, I don't know if it was a deal breaker if they didn't have it, but it would have been a, a tough sell for me to come up there and play in Clark Stadium. Clark Stadium was a very cozy, uh, loud stadium, but uh, it just wasn't what I was used to. But I really felt the warmth of the, of the city, uh, of the people that I met when I was there, uh, the teammates that I met when I was, was there uh, really made me feel comfortable. Uh, and I, I just liked the whole overall atmosphere. You could tell it was a winning, close atmosphere even before I even set foot uh, as far as being a teammate. And uh, that's something that really sold me on coming there too, a place where you felt like you were wanted. Had they, it's a tradition thing that goes around with the Edmonton Eskimos that the day before the game, everybody wear a hat. You wear any kind of hat that you want to wear, do what you want to do, and you act stupid, you put on, we used to put on shows. And it's so funny, man. Hat day, you go out by the worst hat, the nicest hat, the ugliest hat, and we just come out dressed the way you want to dress. The day before the game, 
we needed to do something that was relaxing. Um, I think that lots of times I had felt like teams would leave it on the field the day before a game. They'd build up to this game. They were really ready two days before the game because the coach can't do much the day before the game. The hay's in the barn the day before a game. I mean, you're ready to play now or you're not. You're not going to get ready the day before a game. So this was just a way to, to find the personalities of people and get to know one another. And, and, and that's what Hat Day was all about. We took Hat Day to another level. What we did with Hat Day was us, was we, you, you did wear a hat, but anything that went funny in that game, or anybody did something stupid during practice, anybody got a fight, we redid everything in practice at Hat Day. So if you was in the game and you ran a touchdown or you dropped the ball or you got hit and knocked out, somebody did that, somebody did that show on you the next day at Hat Day. So you, was, you made sure if you did something stupid or something crazy or whatever, Hat Day, you was the, you was the guy. I can remember, well, I watched this game. It was the 93 game Western final, Edmonton versus Calgary. Doug uh, played Edmonton. He was with Calgary. And that was the game that was about 40 or 50 below. That was just ridiculous. The field was ice and there was snow. And no one had any traction. You, they were just slipping everywhere. And yet there was one receiver for the Eskimos that was cutting on a dime. And this guy was running stop and goes, double moves, um, full stride, people slipping, and he caught two very long touchdown passes, Jimmy Sandusky, and um, and I was just amazed. I can remember watching that football game saying, boy, this guy is unbelievable. He's the only one out there that can stop on a dime. He's stopping goes, he's cutting, he's making great plays. Boy, this is amazing. Later, I, I played in Edmonton, 96, um, so I become teammates with this receiver, Jimmy Sandusky. I can remember coming into my 96 semifinal game against Winnipeg uh, in Edmonton with a sheet of ice and, and a huge lineup at Jimmy Sandusky's locker. And he had a Black & Decker drill, and he's drilling nails into the bottom of these uh, shoes and clipping off the, end, the head of the nail so you have a sharp point where you can it would start to cut on a dime. And I said, aha, this is, uh, this is the receiver I saw in 93 tear up Calgary, and now I... I can remember why he was so successful that game. These, uh, you know, these things happen in the Canadian Football League, uh, and I'm sure these aren't the only two games that this existed, but uh, it all did come together that day on, on why he was running such great routes. The Battle of Alberta was a serious, get down, dirty, hard-nosed fight of the years that I played. Now, Edmonton were very good, and I got sick and tired of losing to them, but the fact was they were a tremendous team. Edmonton was always a rivalry. Oh, boy. They says you don't have to win the Grey Cup, just beat those guys up north. And I says, who in the heck is that? Well, you just beat the Eskimos, and you don't have to go to the Grey Cup. And I always remember going down there on Labor Day and playing against them and uh, being in the hotel the night before the game, and their, their crowd would be outside of our hotel trying to keep us up all night, ranting and raving and screaming in, in the night uh, so we couldn't get any sleep, uh, fire alarms going off during the night, anything they could do to disrupt us. It was a, it was a tremendous rivalry, but we came out on the, on the top of it most of the time. To be honest with you, if I look at the two communities uh, where, where Calgary is so close to the mountains and I grew up around mountains, that would be the best city location-wise to be in. But they're red and white. I just wouldn't want to live there. If I went to Calgary and I wore some Edmonton Eskimo stuff, God, people swear at me, cursed at me. It was terrible. But I got them back good, though. Because for the 1993 Grey Cup, me and Willie Pless, we bought 500 stickers, Edmonton Eskimo stickers, and everything we see Calgary Stampede on, we stuck a sticker on it. So it was 500 Edmonton Eskimo stickers sticking on something down there. That was a big rob. I didn't know, people hated me there. This one, I'll never forget this one old lady used to sit behind the bench. She had to be about 80 years old. And I go, 
Now, I, I was warming up on the sideline. She stood up with her cane. I thought she was joking at first. She said, don't you be running touchdowns on this football field. She pointed at me with her cane. I said, oh, I said, oh, grandma. She said, don't you grandma me, because if you do that again and run a touchdown, I'm going to hit you with this damn cane. I'm like, she taking it serious. Oh, she was like, really, you know, didn't want me to be. She go, you always taking the game away from us. And like, oh, I'm like, wow, this made it interesting. <laughs> But it was it was it was a big robbery. I, n I never could figure out why a city, you know, those two cities could hate each other so much. It would have been nice to have seen Tom Forzani and some of those guys lift the Grey Cup, but not at our expense. I'll tell you one quick story. Um, we started this thing. Um, I was doing a banquet in Montreal, and we had a, uh, I was waiting for, well, without name dropping, Larry Robinson, and Larry and I had met at a couple of functions, and uh, so I was waiting for Larry out, out in the ante room of the Montreal Canadiens, and around the whole top of their ante room it had from us that have gone, a whole bunch of pictures of guys from other eras, and it said, from us that have gone before, we pass you the torch. And much as the 54 and 55 Eskimos and those guys from that era had passed a torch to us uh, in a lot of different ways, we needed something on the Eskimos that was going to slingshot where, where we were going and what was happening. And so I phoned Wilk from a payphone right outside the, uh, the uh, dressing room. I said, Wilk, I think we got it, because we were looking for something. So the next year, we started giving out this thing called a torch award, and what it did is that it best exemplified who we thought best exemplified the Eskimos and the kind of Eskimo, if you want to be with us, you should be. And so what we'd do is that we'd have all the coaches leave the first meeting of training camp. And so it's just the rookies and us. And we'd give out this torch to the guy that we thought was the best guy that the year before that, it, that we thought exemplified us. And so what we do is that uh, then we tell these kids that are sitting there, we, you know, we don't give a damn whether you bench press 500 pounds or you can run a 4440. If you don't fit here, you won't be here. And so what this torch was is that you, we told them, you watch this guy on the field, you watch this guy in the dressing room, you watch how he conducts himself because this is what it's going to take to make this team. And so as that went on, we gave torches out each year. And so there would be four or five guys around of all different types of personalities that some rookie could cotton on to and then try to be like that person. And that's how we, st we really started to roll that thing. The ultimate goal in Canadian football is the Grey Cup. Since 1949, the Edmonton Eskimos have experienced the euphoria of capturing the national championship 11 times. In 1954, the Edmonton Eskimos challenged the Montreal Alouettes for the Grey Cup. The Eskimos were considered underdogs against a Montreal team led by Sam the Rifle Echeverry. To counter the Alouette powerhouse, the Eskimos had Jackie Parker, whose immense talent provided timely plays. The biggest one of all came in the fourth quarter, when Parker scooped up a fumble by Montreal's Chuck Hunsinger and galloped 90 yards to the end zone to even the score. Kicker Bob Dean added the convert to give the Eskimos a one-point lead. The youthful Edmonton team would hang on to upset the Montreal Alouettes with a 26-25 victory for their first ever Grey Cup in franchise history. At the 1955 Grey Cup game at Vancouver's Empire Stadium, the Edmonton Eskimos and Montreal Alouettes would clash for the second year in a row. This time, Edmonton was the stronger team, and superstar Jackie Parker led the way by showcasing his talent at quarterback. Parker's ability to read the Montreal defense allowed him to run and pass freely. A large part of his success came from running back Normie Kwong, who tore up the gridiron with 145 yards. In addition to a strong offensive performance, Jackie Parker was instrumental on defense. 
His clutch interception in the third quarter wiped out a potential scoring drive by Echeverry's Alouettes. When the final gun sounded, the Edmonton Eskimos captured their second consecutive Grey Cup with a 34-19 triumph over the Montreal Alouettes. For the third year in a row, the Edmonton Eskimos battled the Montreal Alouettes for the Grey Cup. Canadian-born quarterback Don Getty directed the Eskimos offense. Getty called end runs that spread out the field for the powerful Johnny Bright to run up the middle. Bright would set a Grey Cup record as he rushed for 171 yards. Jackie Parker also shone as he scored three touchdowns in a convincing 50-27 victory over the Montreal Alouettes and the third consecutive Grey Cup for the Edmonton Eskimo dynasty of the 1950s. After losses in the 1960, 73, and 74 Grey Cup games, the Edmonton Eskimos were back in 1975 for a Grey Cup showdown with the Montreal Alouettes at McMahon Stadium in Calgary. In the bitter cold, Dave Cutler kicked three field goals from long range to account for all of Edmonton's points. With a 9-7 lead and no time left on the clock, the Eskimos could only watch as Montreal's all-star kicker Don Sweet attempted a field goal from close range. It would miss, and the Edmonton Eskimos celebrated their first Grey Cup victory in 19 years. The Edmonton Eskimos vowed revenge following a 41-6 beating from the Montreal Alouettes at the 1977 Grey Cup. In 1978, at Toronto CNE Stadium, the Eskimos would have redemption. Edmonton quarterback Tom Wilkinson was masterful as he guided the Eskimo offense. Dan Kepley and Dave Fennell were relentless in their pursuit to contain the Alouettes offense. It was the beginning of a dynasty as the Edmonton Eskimos emerged victorious with a 2013 triumph over the Montreal Alouettes. For the third time in as many years, the 1979 Grey Cup game featured the Edmonton Eskimos and Montreal Alouettes. To achieve victory, the Eskimos would pay the price. Montreal linebacker Tom Cousineau was a one-man gang as he punished the Edmonton ball carriers with thunderous hits. Despite the havoc created by Cousineau, Warren Moon was able to connect for a 33-yard touchdown pass to Tommy Scott for what proved to be the winning points in a 17-9 victory over the Alouettes and the second consecutive Grey Cup for the Edmonton Eskimos. The 1980 Grey Cup saw the Eskimos face the Hamilton Tiger Cats at Toronto's CNE Stadium, where Edmonton quarterback Warren Moon displayed his superior talent. Moon dismantled the Tiger Cats secondary with precision passing. His favorite target was the elusive Tommy Scott. As the Edmonton Eskimos displayed their awesome power in a 48-10 blowout over the Hamilton Tiger Cats to make it three Grey Cups in a row for the Edmonton Eskimos. A year later, at the 1981 Grey Cup, the Edmonton Eskimos made the journey to Montreal for an encounter with the Ottawa Rough Riders. The 5 and 11 Rough Riders entered the game a 22-point underdog and nearly pulled off one of the greatest upsets in CFL history. After the first half, the Rough Riders had a 20 to 1 lead over the mighty Eskimos. In the second half, fueled by desire, the Eskimos came alive as Warren Moon kicked the green machine into overdrive to equal the score. Dave Cutler capped off the amazing comeback with the game-winning field goal in a 26-23 victory over the Ottawa Rough Riders to capture a fourth consecutive Grey Cup for the Edmonton Eskimos. In 1982, the four-time defending Grey Cup champion Edmonton Eskimos met the Toronto Argonauts at CNE Stadium. Warren Moon operated the Edmonton offense to perfection. In the early going, Moon orchestrated a successful aerial attack. When poor weather conditions shut down the airways, Moon shifted to an effective ground attack. The final result would be a 32-16 Eskimo victory over the Toronto Argonauts and a fifth consecutive Grey Cup for the most celebrated franchise in Canadian football. The 
The 1987 Grey Cup marked the 75th anniversary of the National Classic as the Edmonton Eskimos faced the Toronto Argonauts at BC Play Stadium. Henry Gizmo Williams, one of the most exciting players to ever don an Eskimo jersey, electrified the crowd as he turned a missed field goal attempt into a 115-yard touchdown return. In the second quarter, an injury to Matt Dunnigan brought Damon Allen off the Eskimos bench to direct the offense. Allen delivered as he completed 15 of 20 passes for 225 yards that kept pace with a highly productive Argonaut offense. The 75th Grey Cup would end in dramatic fashion. Down by a point with less than a minute to play, Edmonton's Jerry Carrick kicked the game-winning field goal in a thrilling 38-36 victory over the Toronto Argonauts for the 10th Grey Cup in franchise history. At the 1993 Grey Cup, the Edmonton Eskimos clashed with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at McMahon Stadium in Calgary. Edmonton quarterback Damon Allen was expected to duplicate his heroics from 1987. Allen wouldn't disappoint as he threw for 226 yards and led the game in rushing with 90 yards. Combined with Damon Allen's MVP performance, six field goals from the boot of Sean Fleming helped lead the way to a 33-23 victory over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The Edmonton Eskimos continue their rich tradition as future generations strive to become Grey Cup champions. Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. Live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere. Football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. In the Canadian League, uh, there's no such thing as being a rookie. You, you, you're a contributor or you're not, or else you don't make it. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return. It may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ballgame. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL, put my best foot forward. Whatever it took, I was going to get the job done and anything else was not acceptable. I wanted to come play 
In the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one.